going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. Canada's British Columbia. What we notice here first is the trees. An immense forest. It was written that here men would exploit this wood and that it would be at the heart of their economy and their life. They had to chop the wood down, transport it, and then transform it. It created a whole new type of job. And the ocean is at the heart of this process. To tell the story of the people who lived and sometimes died here, one only needs to follow the path of the logs, from the forest to the factory. This story begins in the Quatsino Sound, to the north of Vancouver Island. A journey that takes 45 minutes, and one of silence. A story of the forest and of the sea, and one which tells the history of British Columbia. Well, it takes a lot of nerve and confidence, and if you're gonna sign up for it, you better be willing to eat it, sleep it, and drink it, because if you don't, Take it serious, it will take you. A dozen men are aboard the boat. They find themselves in such a place that they dare not tell their wives that they came. You could say that Kirk grew up here. You have to be there 100% all the time, and you better have your game face on, because if you don't, the game's over. It's that simple. Kirk is a lumberjack and supervisor at Mahata River, where the forests are known to be very dangerous. For us, this is a very foreign world. I did. What a three-year-old. You heard Todd was saying this morning, he, his last day he got home, seen a big grizzly in his lawn. Yeah, there was. It's a grizzly in high a grizzly Yeah, there. I know. They said they've been moving over, right? Yeah. We've been pulling out those ones in the heart. A supervisor at Mahata River That's ensures cool. that things run smoothly, or at least as smoothly as things can possibly go. Kirk is in charge of appointing men to the different cutting areas. There's, there's probably going to be some hazards in there. Probably just what I got written here. Let's see. Jackpots, heavy leaners, loaded limb, limb tied, loaded blowdown, slippery soils, check footing, possible overhead debris, block prone to very high winds. Take caution with all the above. Uh, contact supervisor if cannot be safely managed. Plan will be put in place to safely manage. And sign that. How far do we, before we reach the block? Or... This is a new cutting zone. They build a route for the wood, but it will also serve the lumberjacks. The zone is at the top of the hill, which is the worst possible place it could be. See those trees up along that edge way up there? Now those won't be very, what I call, not user friendly. What happens with those is they're, they could be all rotten around the outside, and as you're starting to fall them and you're starting to let them go, they could, they're, they're very weak up top, right? And they could collapse. So. If Mahata River is so dangerous, it's because the river is on the west coast of Vancouver Island and is sometimes exposed to winds of 200 kilometers an hour coming from the Pacific. The trees split, break, intertwine. It looks like a real battlefield. And this battlefield is also a magnificent primary forest.
we cut guys like this uh, on a fairly regular basis. We've had them up to 20 feet across. And they're probably around, those ones there probably be closer to like 1,200 years old, possibly even older. So that's a pretty old tree. But I find them really challenging and I like them because of that reason. They're challenging. They make me think. They keep me on my toes. Okay, so this tree is gonna go that way. This tree is probably about 400 years old. Might be a little less, a little more. It's been around for a while. It's older than me. That's why I'm getting rid of these trees, make an opening so we got a place to lay this guy in there. To chop down this spruce, Kirk clears the area. Every action has a consequence and there is no place for fallback, unexpected happenings, or misjudging a situation. You don't want trees hooking into other trees. It's okay if you're far enough away. But if you're too close, the top will break off as the tree's catching it and it bends over, the one that's not cut, bends over and then it slips through. The other tree goes and that one comes back, top breaks off or limb comes out. Guess where you're standing? Bullseye. I don't like being bullseye. <laughs> In 2005, 43 of British Columbia's 5,000 lumberjacks were killed doing their jobs. And just last year, there were two fatalities at Mahata River. You know, I would say any follower in his career has probably had situations where it probably wasn't good and thought maybe uh, he got lucky or maybe he just made that last little move at the last second and got out of the way of harm's way and managed to live. Um, yeah, I can think of a few times in my career that I should have been squashed like a bug, but I didn't. Kirk then goes to work on a huge tree. In a short space of time, half an hour, he will chop down a tree 45 meters high and weighing 40 tons. The lumberjacks at Mahata River all say that they've had a day when the smallest of movements could have meant the difference between life and death at the moment when the tree comes down. The spruce is down. Kirk's job is done. In British Columbia, the timber industry employs 120,000 people and generates $11 billion in revenues. Everything begins in these forests here, where we chop down the trees, replant them, and let them grow. And we continue the journey of the tree, which has now become a trunk, also called a log. a log which we have brought down the mountain. We bring it carefully down to the sea. Once they're in the water, men like John take charge. First, they sort. Then they lay out and organize the logs. They are the raft builders. You know, different logging companies, and then it goes to various mills. It's towed down island to various mills, like uh, Campbell River, Nanaimo, Vancouver. It's cheaper to, to boom it up and, and tow it here than it is to truck all this wood here. They can move larger amounts of wood at once, uh, more cheaply. Uh, so I would boom it all up. Only in British Columbia do they transport wood in this fashion. There are also huge boats, but the rafts are still the norm. This 
is where Andy comes into play. Andy is the young captain of Hecate Strait, a tugboat which has, for the past 40 years, traveled the waters between Vancouver Island and the mainland with thousands of tons of wood attached. There are five men on board Hecate Strait. Grayson is just starting out. John is a seasoned open sea fisherman. And Dennis has always lived this way. The tugboat leaves Beaver Cove and heads to the Johnston Straits, losing itself in the maze of islands. It takes eight days to get to the destination, sometimes 15, as it takes four hours by car each day to cover this distance, which follows the coast. The average speed of the convoy is one and a half knots, nearly three kilometers an hour. It's slow, very slow. But they have to pull a raft the size of six football fields. 25 could mean up to 30,000 tons of wood, almost a kilometer in length. Pulling a raft is just like pulling an iceberg. There is much more below the water than above. Known as a boom, the concept is simple. A frame holding logs. In the middle, the logs are tied to bundles, which float. So traveling forward without losing anything is no mean feat, considering that just because things are moving slowly doesn't mean there are no problems. See everything interesting? coming up, but I think we'll be inside by then. We won't have to worry about it. Well, you know, if it gets pretty ugly, you know, 20 and over, it's when it starts getting ugly. And, you know, you can tow in it, but uh, you'll be taking a ride. 35 knots, that's, uh, you don't really want to be towing in that. It's going to be pretty ugly. When you're hauling 30,000 tons behind you, nothing happens fast. So you have the time to enjoy the countryside and to think about alternatives. But there is only one, and that is to get home. But there is a place in Johnston Strait where it's not so easy. Some rough seas in this area all along here. And if it gets too rough, we don't want to be out in it. But if we're down here, there's nowhere we can really hide. We just have to go with it. And with the wind and the current pushing on us, it's going to want to push us past and down. So we're going to have to fight it across. Or it can push us onto Fanny Island, which we don't want to do, because we will break our log tow if we hit that. big responsibility, yep, there's a lot of wood back there, a lot of money. Um, it all comes down on to me if I get her there in one piece or not, and uh, yeah, a lot of responsibility. The next day, Andy starts on the famous passage. Conditions look better than expected. Everything looks good. Well, almost everything. Is that the log outside there on the port side or is it bundle floating? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah.
Andy has to move fast. It's 9 p.m., and once night has fallen, he won't be able to gather the log dogs. First, he has to fetch the trailer. Just gotta get some ropes ready and tie everything in. And if I, yeah. The only thing is, there's wind pushing us down there so far, right? I don't know how that happened. It's not that rough. <laughs> Andy lets the raft drift in the strait. He chases down the log bundles separated from the raft. The wind has come up again, and time is of the essence. When you're captain of a ship, it's never good to lose some of your cargo. John, who is the most experienced of the crew, jumps onto a lost bundle. He ties them back together. Just chuck them that off there and then grab a long rope and then just run it through the both bundles again and tie it off to the boom. Andy brings the stray log bundles back towards the huge raft, left floating in the middle of the strait. Some of the logs are damaged, but that's something to worry about later. For now, the logs just need to be attached. It's not the time nor the place to make it look good, but rather just to make sure it holds so they can get out of here as quickly as possible. Even if you just tie to the head end there, it'll be fine. Oh, there it's good. It's pushing me down so far. Hey, John, John, go under that way and up to that ring up there. Yeah. How's it going there? Good. Did you guys lose some boomsticks? No, we just uh, had about three or four bundles pop out there. Got them all collected up and tied on the side of the toe there now. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, I'm just going past a, uh, three boomsticks strung together here. I thought they might be yours. Did Andy lose oh. a bundle before he noticed what was happening? Do they have their entire cargo? It's hard to say. But if, by a stroke of bad luck, they are missing a few logs, they may not be completely lost. Yeah, that looks good. It's probably going to be low float. You can see the green on it. It's a hemlock. Uh, we'll see how it floats when it uh, gets in the water. That one's a hunk of junk. <laughs> and this one, a small hemlock. Hopefully it floats okay. We'll uh, pull them off. Okay. All right, hang on. Eric Hammond is a beachcomber, or to be more exact, he's a log salvager. He earns a living collecting the logs that have been washed up on the bank. He then sells them off. He's kind of a scrap dealer of the waters, always ready to replenish his stock of wood, which he keeps safely tied up. Eric lives in Howe Sound with his wife and two children. He's hoping that he'll be able to go looking for logs tonight. Earlier this afternoon, might be swinging around. The westerly is good weather, southeast brings rain. But out there, it's kind of exposed to both sides. So, you know, ideally five to 10 would be good. But it might be workable. I don't know, we'll make the judgment call as we get out there, I guess. But it's not as bad as it could be. So let's 
promising. Sometimes I you worried when it goes out. Oh, well... <laughs> <laughs> we make um, jokes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe if he comes home really late or something, but... Um, no, I don't worry too much. I'd be worried all the time, I guess. The conditions are just right, and Eric doesn't waste any time. When you're a beachcomber, you have to be ready to take off quickly. Yeah, the, the faster I go, the more logs I can get. If they're really good logs, it's more incentive to work on a, a lower tide. But uh, yeah, I'd like to have as much time as I could. If I had a full tide all day, I'd be working all day. Speed is efficiency. Yeah. Very quickly, he finds some logs. He's good, or maybe just lucky. He's here. This is good. These are boom sticks. These are the logs that go around the booms. They're actually worth a little bit. So, okay, that's good. It's almost certainly damaged. The wood has broken off its raft and ended up here. 90% of the wood that litters the shores here are logs lost by the industry. Eric only looks for the best logs and searches high and low along the coast, including on people's doorsteps. Seems most of the time they're unhappy about it. Uh, that guy was quite friendly, so that made it easy. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, they think it's their log, or I don't know, they just seem to get angry really easily. They don't understand that I have to pay for a license, and this is my job. They don't, they don't understand. It's a demanding job. Firstly, very physically demanding. And everything has to be done at high speed. Eric only has a few hours to gather up as much wood as he can. The life of a beachcomber is rather solitary. He works completely alone. Which means he has to manage everything alone, the boat and the logs, which can weigh several tons. It's a lot more complicated than it looks, and he's constantly forced to improvise. You never know what you're gonna run into out there. Uh, in some ways it becomes routine, but some ways not. Like I say, there's always different challenges come up. Yeah, we try. It might be. I don't wanna leave it if it is. Don't stand there. If the okay. riot low breaks, yeah. When you're a log salvager, it's all about the small victories. That's getting to be a heavy load. It's good. Tonight, the haul's been a good one. But that's not always the case, even if beachcombers are becoming a rare species. The competition isn't so fierce anymore, and people aren't, I don't know, it's, maybe people have changed too, I don't know, it's not, 
It's not the fierceness to it. Maybe because there isn't the money behind it. It's money makes people do funny things, so maybe it, so that's it. Maybe since we don't get paid as much, so you just don't have the incentive to get out there sooner and faster. After last night's difficulties, the Hector Strait stops. It's a good time to repair the damaged raft. And here, every time the tugboat passes through, an eagle comes to say hello. Oh, I just fed him, fed him some garlic sausage. I don't think he sees it though. About a half a mile back, he'll come and land on the tow, and then right here at the water hole, he seems to be here every time, it must be his home. But he comes and hangs out. And... So what we're gonna do is just push all the wood back, tighten it up, then we'll bring all that other stuff and put it back in. What you have to do every time before you go to the rapids? Um, no, just because these bundles popped out in that weather we had the other day. So, it doesn't really happen too often, but every once in a while it'll happen. They take advantage of the time to repair the raft and make it more secure. They'll soon have to face the strong currents of the Narrows, which is always a delicate place to maneuver through, and they need to be ready. I can't fucking pull this up, man. Working on the raft is very physical. You gotta go back around the stick. The joke just came undone. And he helps them. He pushes hundreds of tons of wood with the tugboat while his men are balancing on top of the raft. This requires a certain amount of finesse. You always gotta be paying attention where they are, make sure they're not in the wrong spot. Don't fall in. Be very aware. Yeah, it happened to me a long time ago, yeah. I fell in between two logs. Log booms coming together there, and I got myself out in time, but it ended up uh, catching my leg, my shin, and uh, I cracked my shin bone. And, yeah, it didn't feel too good. Three hours of very tough work, then a quick break before setting off again with the tide. Come on, Andy, let's go get some fish. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Here's an expert. You have to be a good worker to work on Andy's boat. You good when he's fishing? That's right. He's the boss. He does what he wants. He's done it a long time, so he can do what he wants. Hey, hey. Get up stop. Despite his young age, Andy is a demanding captain. But he's also a captain who has what he calls the tug life the life on board the tugboat. A peaceful life, full of enjoyable experiences. It's called a wing cod. That one's big enough to keep, so let's get her. The Hecate Straits continues its journey. Soon, a small tugboat joins them. It's a boat that will stay with them in order to help the journey across the Seymour Passage, also known as the Narrows, where only the most experienced captain dares to go with this big a cargo. Hey, there we go. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, it was a pretty smooth shot there. Everything went good, eh? Yeah, it's, it's not something anybody can just come do. Like, Andy's probably been doing this for probably about a good 10 years now. Ever since, ever since I started coming out working here, I actually started working with him. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff you need to know. Like right now, all the snow and stuff's melting off of the top of the mountain, so we got fresh water coming out of all the inlets and stuff, so it, it messes with the tides in certain spots. So you gotta know, know when that's how it's gonna mess you out. When I first started, uh, you know, 
the first few times going through the rapids by myself. Yeah, it was it was a little overwhelming, I guess. Um, but you get over it. I, you know, now that I've done it a lot, you know, not too much to worry about now. There's some tides, you know, that that'll get you, and you know, they'll give you that little rush you get, but. In How Sound, Eric the Beachcomber has a visitor. Yeah, just uh, start at that end there. Sure. Sometimes I am disappointed. I think that a log was going to be bigger than it was, but you know, he has the final say. So. So yeah, anyway, I've got to kind of make sure that he gets them all, so I'll kind of uh, feed them to him as he needs to, to see them, so. The visitor is a scaler. He assesses the wood, and it is his evaluation that turns the wood into money for Eric when he sells it. The man is independent. He does not directly work for buyers, and thus he is impartial. Uh, it's a, it's a, a mix. Uh, some of these high floating logs are uh, a good quality wood. Some of the ones you see that are floating lowly, um, not so good. So you have to say what, what, what kind of wood it is, uh, yeah. the length and the size and... That's right. The, the species, the length, the top, the butt diameter, and a grade that's uh, afforded each log, uh, having to do with its value. But this formula it change uh, I mean all the time according to the price and uh, of the market I don't know or... that's right two or three times a year they do an adjustment of the value of the wood according to the market for the next few hours the scaler records each log then he gives his verdict 370 pieces okay. uh, 215 meters the assessment isn't great and means less money than Eric expected. Uh, I don't know for the price, but there's 370 pieces and 215 meters. So there's definitely less than a meter average per log. So, so yeah. But then I guess you could say average log uh, it gets complicated. But I mean, price per meter, say, is 30 bucks. So nice. to me, it's the beachcombers are the ones that are out there doing the hard work, trying to keep our waters clear. And uh, there's just not as much compensation as they should uh, receive for that kind of work. That definitely the system is stacked against the beachcombers in my, in my estimation, but I probably shouldn't be saying that. Eric will make about $6,500 for his lot, which is not a lot, considering the time he spent collecting the wood. He goes home to tell his wife. Well, longer than him, yeah. <laughs> Today is 370 pieces, 215 meters. Pretty small logs. <laughs> <laughs> Better than none. It's out there, at least. Good. Yeah. So being a beachcomber, is it more about a lifestyle? Yeah, good question. Well... I think because there's no question. Like, it is a lifestyle. There's just no way around it. Because Eric could probably do different work and make more money uh, doing something else. Um, but he loves doing this. He'll come home some nights and just be beaming because it was perfect. <laughs> the weather or... Um, or the logs or something. So he gets excited about it and loves it. Can't really imagine him doing anything else. We often hear about the call of the sea, an irresistible urge to go to sea. For Eric, it's clear that he feels the call of the beachcomber, a need to hunt for logs.
However, lost wood is becoming more of a rarity. Fewer forest areas are being chopped down, and technological innovation means that there are fewer logs lost at sea. Rafts are more solid and better designed. Things are also changing in Howe Sound, which was once known as the beachcombing mecca of British Columbia. Definitely a higher end, it's very expensive. Uh, there used to be a lot of cottages along here, but they've all been bought up and giant mansions put in their place. I, it seems to me that an attitude comes with it. I hate to say it. That's what I've run into so far. For example, just to get an idea, what is the kind of price of this kind of house over here? On the oh, ocean? man. Easily million, million dollars, easy, easy. Yeah. I'm never gonna buy it, so I don't need to know. But Eric continues fighting, literally and metaphorically. He doesn't need to go to the gym, as working with the wood is a constant workout. You bastard. I mean, there is a point of diminishing returns of the log isn't worth the time. You might as well continue on to easier logs. Uh, that's just something you have to make that judgment call at the time and just give up. Or if you are uh, stubborn, sometimes you just keep working on it and don't let the log win. Depends how I'm feeling. Eric's a rare breed of beachcomber as he continues to earn his living the same way his father and grandfather did before him. But the way things are going, he's becoming more and more comparable to the last of the Mohicans. If, it, uh, if the job goes away, we'll see how, if I stay sane. <laughs> I would say so, yeah, I, I would have to find another job in the water. Preferably working by myself, for myself. I don't know uh, what else is out there that does that. The Hecate Strait arrives in the infamous Narrows, a dreaded route. In the Narrows, currents can reach up to 17 knots. Today, they're at nine knots. That might not seem like a lot, but imagine hauling 30,000 tons around, moving along arduously at three kilometers an hour, and your journey is disturbed by the turbulent eddies, which move six times faster than you. Ah, uh, yeah, usually. Calms the nerves a little bit, I guess. The Johnston Strait begins to narrow. Huge masses of water are concentrated here due to the effects of the tides. With this cargo, Andy has to work with the currents to maneuver and avoid disaster. The current is pushing him. The raft is gathering speed. Andy begins his maneuver. Okay. It's being a bitchy tide. The battle is on. Pulling really hard this way and it's still pushing me really hard down that way right now. So. Make sure you clear in there. Yeah, you betcha. Yeah, really try yeah, to much more. I can't get right off the port bow here. The smaller tugboat, which helps the boat get through the narrows, comes to help in order to balance things out, or at least to try, given the inertia of the 30,000 tons of wood. This is the moment of truth. On the radar, they're getting dangerously close to the coastline. Andy is worried. 
the raft keeps on drifting. Finally, it gets back on track. The key is to stay in front of your toe at all times. If your toe passes you, then you're in trouble. Yeah, hard part's over. Andy and the Hecate Straits only have to follow the rest of their route. From here on out, it's plain sailing to their destination, the sawmill. John's next job is to supply a sawmill located on the edge of town. He's done it all before, but today, he doesn't have time to joke around. Today we have a changeover. That means one customer's cut is finished, we start a new one. Uh, we're a little bit behind. Morning, Charman. How's it going? Good. Good deal. Pinda is his right-hand man and boss on the water. The morning begins with a rude awakening. Right, otherwise you, otherwise you can't make it that many logs. Most of the time, you know, you can go, go, go all day long. We uh, sorted out the tags, there's 10 and 15, 10 and 5, 15. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll be on time, it's, uh, we're always on time, but it's just uh, one of these days, it's a rush. Everybody has to go fast. Yeah, one of the things is fell, fell in the water. Uh -huh. 6.30 a.m., Pinda and John get back on board their funny little boats. It's a type of boat that you'll only find in British Columbia, a boom boat. A funny name, but they're not here to joke around. It can be dangerous sometimes, you know. Make sure, you know, we watch each other, what we're doing, and uh, that's all I want it. Yeah, we have to watch these guys work in front of me, you know, we don't want to hurt them. The race against the clock begins. They only have a few hours to collect, sort, select, and calibrate all the wood which is gathering in the Fraser River at the foot of the sawmill. Just a few hours to supply the factory and free up the zone for the next load which is about to arrive. Everything is happening on board this boom boat, a sort of maritime bumper car. This log is too big, it'll have to be split. We also have to watch we don't get the logs running into the uh, splitter saw. That could cause a major problem. So in order to drive these boats, we normally train our people first, you know, cutting bundle wires, pushing logs, and then uh, after about a month, we'll get them in the boats. So it might take uh, two or three months before they're fully qualified. The job actually is not too difficult. But you certainly have to know what you're doing. Mid-morning, they'll take a break, and they'll take notes on the logs they've treated 
and those that are left to do. We want them with 14 bundle? Well, there should be one with 14 bundles and well, one with 19 bundles. Oh, oh, do you have a bedroom of your own right now? Yeah, no, we just finished that one, right? We just started this one? Yeah, we own the 14 bundle, yeah. We own that one. Then okay, we're on the 14 bundles? Yeah. Okay, then that's... Yeah, 66. Yeah. Now is the best moment oh, okay. to find out a bit more about them. We got last week we working midnight Friday Thursday night. I thought you got a little bit behind. Be okay. My family like a third generation here, but I'm born in India. When I was a little kid, my dad died, and he used to be truck driver here. And my brother worked in the sawmill. That's the only thing we know. Now, now the new kid will lawyer, doctor. Drug dealers, <laughs> and all kind of other stuff. <laughs> the last, there used to be quite a few up and down the river, but they've gradually uh, gone away. You know, uh, they've been shipping on an awful lot of raw logs from Vancouver, from Vancouver Island. You know, ship the logs by freighter overseas. So, I mean, they're just taking jobs away from local people, you know. If they want to buy wood, buy the lumber after we process it, and uh, the on economy here would start to grow. Because now there are less sawmills than what a lot. There's a lot less sawmills now in Vancouver itself. They, used, it they used to be all up and down the river, and uh, no more. We're the last one in Vancouver. The sawmill industry is not flourishing as it once was. But the pace of work here is just as frantic. Just as the new load appears on the horizon, John, Pinda, and the others finally make up for their lost time. For seven hours, they continuously supply the factory with logs, a factory which operates 24-7, 365 days a year. The logs have survived their long voyage. It's here that the journey will end for a 400-year-old tree which was chopped down by a lumberjack a long way north on the west coast of Vancouver Island. The tree has been transformed into smaller pieces of lumber and will almost certainly end up in another country. 90% of the wood from British Columbia is exported. And during this time, Eric collects the logs which have washed up on the shore during their journey up the river. Who knows how much longer he can keep on making a living like this, but it's sure that he'll continue as long as possible in a job that he loves. As for Randy, he's taken on a new role. With every voyage, he gets more experienced. The Johnston Strait is his kingdom. In the north of Vancouver Island, Kirk chops down trees in the great forest of Mahata River. The trees are felled and carried down the mountain to rejoin the river. This is the eternal cycle of British Columbia. <laughs> 